All right, let's go on and um, get going. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for our, our illuminated uh, webinar session with Dr. Peter Faustino about planning for uncertainty, how pandemic anxiety is disrupting school systems. And I think this is a topic that, that all of us can relate to um, and, and thinking about the return to school and um, what our students have, our students and, and our staff um, have endured over the last year and a half. Um, Dr. Faustino has some really, really wonderful insight to share with us. Um, before we get started, I wanna walk through our agenda. So Dr. Faustino, if you'll go to the next slide. So we will I will have a, a short introduction and then we'll get into the presentation, which is why you all are here today. And then we'll save um, 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, if there are any questions that we are not able to get to during those 10 minutes, please rest assured that we will um, follow up on those and send you communication when we send your uh, the recording in your certificate of completion or certificate of attendance. Um, and if we can go to the next one, I um, wanted to share with you guys a little bit about um, Iluma Online Therapy. We are dedicated to solving problems in the areas of special education and mental health um, through live services online with dedicated therapists. Um, committed to providing excellent therapy services for students. Um, it, we are founded in 2011, so we're celebrating our 10th anniversary slash birthday this year. Um, and we have 299 dedicated team members serving over 22,000 students in 36 states. Um, we're really, really proud of that and, um, and look forward to continuing to serve more students across the country. Uh, going forward. Just a little housekeeping about the webinar, if we can advance one, Dr. Faustino. This is part of our Illuminated webinar series. A recording of this session um, will be posted to the webinar page at illumatherapy.com. Uh, Dr. Faustino's slide deck and certificate of attendance and a certificate of attendance will be sent out to all attendees after the webinar. I want to make a note really quick that as we get into Dr. Faustino's deck, he has graciously linked a wealth of resources um, on each of the slides. So when you when you receive the deck, please um, you know that those are hyperlinked and you can access the resources that he references during his presentation. So thank you for doing that, Dr. Faustino. That's extremely helpful. Um, and now let me tell you just a little bit about Dr. Peter Faustino. Um, I have had the pleasure of getting to know him and um, I'm really excited to see him present. He has been working with, school, with adolescents as a school psychologist for more than 25 years, is currently the NYS delegate and Northeast Regional Representative for NASP. He is past president um, within NYS and uh, of the New York Association of School Psychologists and is currently the president of Westchester County Psychological Association. In addition to all of that, Dr. Faustino also has a private practice within the DAIC in Bedford Hills, New York and Greenwich, Connecticut, specializing in adolescent behavior, anxiety disorders and autism. Dr. Faustino, I am so grateful. We are so grateful to have you and I'm, I'm honored to turn it over to you and let you take it away. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, I do think anytime I hear those like intro bios, I start to think, when do I sleep? Um, and I'm not sure I've got an answer to that. Um, so um, don't necessarily come to me for advice on work-life balance. I think sometimes that might be a little bit um, skewed for me, but um, I do want to thank um, both you, Jamie, and George, and Iluma for um, giving me this opportunity. I think for me, I'm quite passionate about just um, amplifying the message around mental health and just its critical importance, um, in particular in school systems, because that's where I've spent um, most of my time. And um, that's really my hope. I, I want to be able to spark a conversation, not, not only um, today, 
through this PowerPoint, but just ongoing. And, and you guys are um, providing a wonderful venue for that. Um, when we talked initially about putting something together, I, I was really kind of um, eager to talk about this idea of, idea of planning for uncertainty and just anxiety around all of this. Um, because I think as I reflect a little bit on the pandemic, one of the things I've realized is that um, in working with kids, quite often kids will come to the adults in their lives and ask for advice or ask for some help. And the adults are able to say, oh, that happened to me when I was a kid, or you know what, I know exactly what we're gonna do next. And that's how we can do it. Now, the adolescents don't always take that advice, but at least the adults were feeling like they had something to say, had something to offer. And unfortunately, over the last year, and probably for the foreseeable future, the adults do not currently have all the answers to the things that are going on. And so the question becomes, where do we look? Where, where do we go next? And I think, as Jamie mentioned, I tried to put together a PowerPoint deck that is hyperlinked on every single page. So when you look on it, if you see a graphic or an image, just click it and chances are it's gonna take you to additional information, additional resources, because there's no way that we're gonna cover everything in the next 30 minutes. Um, as you guys heard, I wear a lot of different hats and one of them is with the National Association of School Psychologists. They are a tremendous organization. Um, I, I'm so proud of the work that they do all the time, but in particular around the pandemic, um, when schools you know, closed and, and so many people were looking for resources, NASP created a COVID-19 resource center that is just jam-packed with information. Um, there's sections on there for return to school. There's ones for special education. There's one for mental health and particularly one for families. And so um, the hyperlinks here will take you to um, NASP's resources with regards to that. But one of the um, quotes or one of the um, sort of like messages that NASP had put out early with regards to COVID-19 was that, um, you know, schools are planning for students and staff to return following the closures and that we must prioritize lots of things. I mean, schools are sort of these, can be very complex organizations. And really what we've got to start doing is focusing a bit on the social, emotional, mental and behavioral health needs, but equally important, right? Ensuring that staff feels that their physical and mental health needs are supported as well. I know Jamie referenced that. Um, the districts, in addition to all those responsibilities and teaching, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, it's, it's also have to look at the policies and recommendations for culturally sensitive um, environments, as well as ensuring equity and access for all youth. I mean, that sort of almost sets the stage of how challenging this work is when we talk about um, being uh, related to a school or being a school professional. And I think, um, if nothing else, I, I, it's important that we do take a moment and just put it into context that um, the last year with the pandemic has really um, created a global education crisis. And those are not my words. That's actually according to you know UNICEF, um, who is collecting a lot of data and putting together resources. Um, they're saying that this is will be the biggest global crisis for children since World War II, um, knowing that students you know have just had this huge impact to their education. And that's not to say that there was not a concern, a crisis beforehand, in particular when we talk about mental health, um, the crisis existed before. Um, we, we you know, share numbers that it's one in five children were dealing with a mental health condition that affected them on a daily basis and affected various aspects of their life, including learning. And what we know is that a lot of those percentages are um, the majority are not able to access appropriate mental health services. And the ones that do um, will get them in schools because that's where children are at. And so um, the term I've been sort of using, and I put the little graphic there, um, is that you know we may be looking at a tsunami. Um, the idea that a tsunami is this like long sea wave that um, comes crashing to, to land um, after say an earthquake or a submarine landslide or some other disturbance, you know, COVID-19, I think, is now waning, um, although you watch the news and it's just, you know, daily reports that, that make us nervous. But if we assume that the virus has abated, 
Um, what we may be still looking at is the impact on children um, in the form of, of a tsunami. And, and you know, one other um, statistic from the World Health Organization and UNICEF is the idea that you know, with about 2 billion children on the planet, uh, 350 million of them didn't have access to remote learning. And I don't think that that's um, just worldwide. I think many of our own communities and many of you who are listening to this webinar now will recognize that you know families that did not have um, good access to technology for remote learning. And so there's a whole group of students that received very little instruction um, over the last year. Um, what do I mean when I say pandemic anxiety? I, I think what I really wanted to reference is that um, we sort of share this um, trauma um, right now. And, and you know, I, when I was thinking about it, right, trauma leaves this sort of indelible mark on each of us. And I think the question is, what is that lasting mark that's going to be on you? Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's, I'm trying to weave in humor and some fun and engagement. Sometimes it can be a tough topic to talk about, but um, uh, I found this uh, example of a tattoo that, you know, sort of tattoo gone wrong, right? It's, is my life John Bowie? Um, you know, that, that's not the kind of tattoo that we want to be left with, even if we have really good intentions of, of you know, what we want to look like coming out of this. Um, and I think for the foreseeable future, um, anxiety is going to be the primary struggle for so many, um, even with like repeated reassurance that the threat is really gone and that the habits, you know, will change and fade. Our nervous systems don't necessarily allow us to just bounce back the way we might think that it could. We're actually going to need more time to calm down and, um, you know, allow that, um, you know, that it did not initially escalate to, to just kind of, you know, go into that survival mode. Um, and investigating, you know, sort of like the structures of groups and organizations and societies, right, and how people interact with these contexts, we, we really can look a little bit on that individual level to experience or, or to make parallels. And so sometimes I think about in my own life, what do I spend a lot of time doing when we're thinking about the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic? We're talking about it. We're, 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 we're seeking support people. We're looking for friends and others. And we're having conversations that sound like, I want to process the event. I want to talk about the event. I need an opportunity to do that. And we're going to, I think I've got a note in the slide later on just about the idea of agency. How do we sort of like help individuals decide when that's appropriate or um, increase access to those opportunities to do those kinds of things? Um, I know that um, I've got a lot of people or friends that are in the business sector and um, they're having large conversations about whether or not they return. I think today in the news, Amazon talked about that their employees will have some choice as to where they're gonna work and when they get to come back. We don't often offer that to children. And so I think it's gonna be important to consider these kinds of things as we're developing strategies to return. Um, you know, I don't wanna take it for granted that everybody uses the same sort of like terminology around anxiety, but it's, you know, this idea that um, a little bit of anxiety is certainly a normal part of life. However, people with anxiety disorders are experiencing frequent, intense, excessive, persistent worry. You know, they'll describe it as they, they can't control their thoughts and they can't get them out or that the thoughts are, you know, just um, ever present, right? Often these anxiety disorders involve repeated episodes of that sudden feeling of intense anxiety or fear. Um, even the idea that sort of terror comes back and we'll reference those as panic attacks. Um, even if you identify sometimes what the triggers are behind those things, sometimes we can fear just the panic attacks return, which is important to know. These feelings of anxiety and panic really do interfere with daily activities. It's not sort of like I'm feeling anxious and worried, but I'm still going to get up and go through all of my routines. It really is an impediment to um, being able to do the things that we do on a daily level, um, having difficulty controlling them. And then really, um, when you're no longer in danger, feeling as if that actual danger is still there. Um, you know, these symptoms may start in childhood or teenage years, but the truth is that we're all um, susceptible to them. And I know many adults that are struggling with anxiety in various forms as well. What we know is actually a lot about anxiety and anxiety disorders. And there are several risk factors that I think, um, you know, increase the, the chances that we could um, develop or struggle with an anxiety condition. 
Um, and again, I think during the pandemic, I saw all these memes and these other, you know, uh, clever ways to use humor to manage some of the stress that was around it. Um, this one I thought was particularly funny in that, um, you know, working moms, working dads who are now um, trying to homeschool their kids. Day one, everything looked quite cheery and rosy. By day five, um, you know, it was a very different picture. But some of these risk factors include prior trauma. Um, and I know there was a presentation with Iluma and Dr. Eric Rawson on trauma, um, you know, and I, I, I would reference that, you know, when you've experienced that kind of trauma, you're really um, at risk for so many other types of things in your life. Um, and anxiety disorders is one of them. Stress due to an illness. Um, sometimes people are dealing with physical um, ailments that just contribute to the idea of insecurity and, and um, difficulty trusting in you know, the safety around you. Stress buildup, I, I, you know, that, that meme sort of says it all, right? I mean, um, everybody was experiencing intense stress over the last year. Some personalities I think are more prone. I actually work, I feel like with a lot of very intellectual, smart, yet sometimes introverted individuals who spend time overthinking and dwelling on the possibilities and the what ifs. And if that is your type of personality, you may be prone when we add all this additional stress to it as well. Um, depression and anxiety, I think are quite often comorbid conditions where you know, anxiety left untreated can develop into depression. And so we need to um, really be mindful of the other conditions that are out there that need to be treated. Um, certainly having relatives, there's a genetic component um, for this as well. And ironically, the things that we should turn to either last or never, which would be drugs or alcohol, are the things that people sometimes turn to first when they're concerned um, or feeling anxious and overwhelmed. So if you work with children and teens, and I assume that many of you are on the webinar, um, you know, because you have some connection um, to kids, as the children sort of prepare to go back to school, there's undoubtedly going to be, um, I think, fear and anxiety about what will the world of school look like. And some of those fears are going to be really dealing with what I wrote here. It's this idea of, you know, future events. Is school going to be the same? Can I play sports or band this year? What is it going to look like? Is it going to change? Because I think one of the things that was incredibly difficult for adults and staff and communities alike was the constant change and new information that we had to kind of absorb. Um, what about imagined events, right? Am I going to get the virus? Am I infected? Can I spread it without knowing? Am I gonna hurt someone that I love um, because I, I, I can't see this or I don't have all the answers about it? Then there are real environmental dangers. Will I be safe at school? Um, what if my teacher contracts COVID um, or what if, you know, there is a, a real threat um, that I need to deal with. And then certainly other times I'm hearing from children and teens this idea of the unknown, right? Why is the world different? Um, am I behind in my learning? Am I going to fail? Will I get into college? Will my friends still like me? Um, are my friends returning to school? These are still so many unanswered questions, even though we are right at the end of this school year and starting to think about um, next year. So if we start to shift a little bit at this point of the presentation to think a little bit about how do we um, work our way out of it or how do we sort of, um, you know, address some of the things that, that, that we know and, 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 and are thinking about. Um, I, I love this African uh, proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And I, I think it really represents what I'd like to say about the building back for most schools and communities, which is we are going to need to work together. Um, one of the things that I sometimes struggle with when I'm in the weeds and I'm thinking about these top topics is, is there a framework that could help me better understand the things that we know through research, through experience, through professional practice that will help us build back? Um, and I'm a particular fan of the um, PERMA model, which is really um, born out of positive psychology. And this is the idea that, um, you know, these um, themes, these areas, these sort of pillars, that if we are addressing elements of each in the work that we do, in the planning that we do, that quite often we can um, develop some strategies. And so, you know, without delving too deep, and again, the graphic up in the right corner will take you to more information, but it's the idea that 
um, are we finding ways to build in positive emotions in ourselves or in our community? Did we found the right balance of positivity. And I'm not talking about po toxic positivity, this idea of like, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't even think about negative things. It's just the idea of like, are we building opportunities for um, some, you know, positive emotions tied to that, or they're all interconnected is the idea of engagement, right? Are we, are we really having conversations about what we're good at? What are our strengths? and um, things that we're good at or we simply enjoy doing. Um, and with teenagers, they always love to say video games, but I try to steer them away and explain that that might just simply be a distraction or taking them away and escape from all of the things that I'm describing. But real engagement is almost like being in a zone with, uh, with an activity or a hobby or something that you're quite good at. Relationships, and I, I can't stress this one enough. I feel like um, when I'm at a loss for answers, sometimes I revert back to the idea that if we can create authentic, energizing, supportive relationships, sometimes it only has to be a small number of them. Um, and it's important that they're consistent and long-term. We actually know that there are tremendous buffer effects to all of the stress and um, anxiety and depression that we're concerned about. Um, meaning is just this idea, are we connected to something bigger? Um, and in what ways do, do we see those opportunities for meaning? Same with achievement, right? It's the idea that we're setting goals and this belief that we might be able to pursue those or move in that direction. And I think, um, you know, ideally we set up um, goals and achievements that are achievable that we can actually meet and master. The other one that um, is sort of new to the PERMA model is this idea of vitality. And I, I have to say, early in the pandemic, or at some point in the middle of the pandemic, I think this was the one that I noticed the most people struggling with, which was the idea, were we eating right? Were we moving regularly? We were sleeping, you know, so that we were getting rest. And the answer was no, we had developed a lot of really bad habits, I think, um, during the pandemic. So if that PERMA model of positive psychology gives you somewhat of a framework to start this conversation around, um, when we whittle down to anxiety, what I would say to you is that one of the things that you should be familiar with if you're not already is this idea of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy um, in schools. And the idea is, you know, similar to what most people have heard, perhaps the fight or flight response. Um, and the way I tend to talk about it is more the threat and challenge response, um, you know, because I, I think even the word choice lets us, reminds us that it's not that we're fighting for our lives but rather there are threats and challenges that we've got to overcome. But, you know, when faced with our adversity, our brain sort of listens to what we say. That's the cognitive piece of it, right? So for example, if your child is saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm going to fail, then clearly that threat response gets worked up, you know, shutting down um, all the systems to solutions. However, if we start to change some of those, think, those thought patterns or those conversations around, this is hard and challenging, but we can do it. Or it is hard and challenging, but I can figure it out. Or it's hard and challenging, but I'm gonna ask for some help. Then immediately our brain begins to activate this challenge response that somehow we're going to start to work on problem solving um, the, the dilemma that's in front of us. And research has really demonstrated that simply educating people about this stress response in our bodies can quite often help them identify and then activate that challenge response to stress. Um, this is not my uh, novel idea. There's actually a lot of sort of wonderful materials that are being developed in this area, in particular around CBT, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, or even, um, you know, some of the lesser skills of what's called DBT, which is dialectical behavior therapy in schools. And again, I've got links in there for so much more information that you can find about that. But really, it's, it's the simple idea that we need to teach direct skills in order to manage this stress. This idea that, um, and I was having a conversation earlier today about the idea that sometimes as adults, we just sort of happened upon what works. or we struggled through it only to come out better on the other end, but we don't have to do that struggle or we can minimize some of that you know, searching for answers because the materials are there. And so, you know, again, if you click the links, um, you'll get a, you know, a, a wonderful, you know, um, synopsis of great information. And, and for those of you that are familiar with CBT, it really is this idea of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And if we start to identify and work on aspects of that, we are going to um, move 
children and ourselves in the right direction. Um, if we're still sort of looking at that, you know, help me, give me a roadmap, right, to getting back to um, learning for schools. Um, I, 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 I think NASP created one of the most beautiful documents in Ready to Learn, Empowered to Teach. This is really sort of a, a comprehensive review of um, school structures and policies. It's, it sort of gives guidance as to what you ought to be looking for. And, you know, to, to spoiler alert, right, the, the, the end of that document is going to talk to you about creating positive school climates, that climates that balance physical and psychological safety for all students. And, um, and there's a lot of ideas and ways that you'll gain access, I think, to doing that um, if you click the link for that document. But it, um, you know, it sort of does, and as a school psychologist, you know, some of it is going to revolve around providing access to comprehensive school-based mental and behavioral health services. Unfortunately, there is a tremendous shortage of school psychologists nationwide. And so ensuring adequate staffing levels is going to be one of those um, bigger conversations or one of those conversations, I think, that starts to um, need to take place now as we've got a few months to sort of stay ahead of the curve. Um, social emotional learning, you know, gets referenced and talked about a lot. Um, it, it's wonderful material, but sometimes it can just sort of seem ubiquitous or, or um, overarching and, and large. And then at other times, I think people use the term, you know, describe just lots of things that they're doing. Um, some of the interesting advocacy work that I get to do, right? The American Rescue Plan is, is uh, earmarking $123 billion into K-12 education. And much of it is being talked about the critical opportunity for um, social emotional learning. I think with regards to this, um, if money is coming into school districts, it's going to be important to have conversations about how is that money gonna be well spent? Um, and I wanted to give just two examples or there's two hyperlinks in here. One to Castle, which is um, I think located out of New Jersey. I know Maurice Elias and Rutgers University does a lot of work with Castle, but um, it's, uh, it's you know kind of the elite center for social emotional learning. Tons of information, tons of resources, ways to connect with professionals, um, ways to just kind of outline how, if you are interested in social emotional learning, um, you would do. And then sort of, you know, a little bit of self-pride, a little bit of New York, uh, you know, bravado, right? New York State Education Department during the pandemic put out some really remarkable resources around social emotional learning, recognizing that in the midst of the pandemic, as well as after the pandemic, um, schools were going to need to prioritize social emotional learning in a variety of ways. And so if you click that link in the PowerPoint, you're going to find um, all kinds of sort of like state um, materials and resources, ones that are easily adaptable or hopefully will give you guys all kinds of ideas about how to do this in your schools. Where do we find ourselves right now? Um, and, and this is an interesting conversation because as much as I know we're having um, discussions around, um, you know, let's reflect on the pandemic, let's talk about what we learned, what we want to keep, what we want to change. I am concerned that um, two things are going to happen. One, we're just going to return to old ways because it just feels comfortable and that's the way we did it. Um, and the second is that we're going to revert to um, you know, policies that are just not appropriate or conversations that are just unhealthy for children because it's an easy conceptual thing to talk about. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to bold it enough, but to say, please do not think about catching up retention or referrals to special education as the way to get your school districts out of this, um, you know, uh, dilemma out of this uh, challenge come the fall. And uh, I was trying to think of an analogy. Um, I don't like to run, but I did run a marathon a, a, a few years prior. And I started to think like if I had run the majority of the marathon and I was exhausted and I felt like giving up and someone said to me at that moment, well, you know, you're behind and you need to catch up. Uh, you know, you, you have to run faster or put more effort than you currently are. I probably would have said I was quitting because um, there was no way I was going to catch 
someone or something. I was running at my own pace and, and that was the best I could do. I was just hoping to get to the finish line. Um, in addition, you know, retention is almost like if I'm running the marathon and I'm getting close to the finish line and they say, hey, you know, you didn't have your best time. Why don't we put you back in the beginning and have you run the whole marathon again? Um, I, I'd have a few choice words for, for that suggestion as well. And then, you know, finally, and this doesn't take away from people who need special education, but um, referrals to special education that are unnecessary. If, if you're struggling during the pandemic, everybody's struggling during the pandemic. I think we just have to be very thoughtful about those referrals as to whether it's things that existed well prior to the pandemic or whether or not it's the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, and so you've got a little NIASP logo down there, hyperlink. That actually will take you to a wonderful re-entry document that will address a lot of these topics in greater depth than I'm going over. But it's the idea that please begin thoughtful planning now for the fall of 2021 in order to really like address the academic emotional impacts of this health crisis. And really, we're, we're going to need a response that is not business as usual. Um, it's going to have to be extraordinary just because our children deserve it and our future um, is really sort of depend on it. One of the other things that I think is noteworthy is sort of community and parent um, work. Uh, sometimes, I mean, I think, I think everybody in education sort of knows this, but I just need to highlight it again that uh, we're doing some extraordinary things in schools, and yet parents don't often have the same resources or tools that schools do. And so children are going home and needing, I think, that same level of support or resources. And so here is actually a whole parent guide um, that's going to have all kinds of remarkable resources. A lot of them might be focused in New York, but it will give you tremendous ideas if you click on this for parent um, and community resources. And tied to that are quite often special populations. And, and that's where I am referring a little bit to special education or special needs, because um, I think during the pandemic, they all created some really wonderful guidance that benefits all of us. I, I like this cartoon so much because it, it makes me think, right? I mean, um, if, if you can see it, it's sort of a snowy day. I'm, I'm in New York, so we do get snow up here, right? Not, not now, but anything's possible. Um, and, you know, the, the school or the person is clearing the steps uh, for the masses, for the large group of students, and yet there's a ramp on the side and a young man in a wheelchair and it says, could you please shovel the ramp? And the adult says, well, all of these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling the stairs off, then I'm going to clear the ramp for you. And that same child says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. And it's definitely one of those moments that you think, aha, if I start thinking about some of those special populations, some of the groups that may need you know, more thought put into their re-entry into schools, we are actually going to be able to clear pathways for every single student um, that we work with. And I think that's, that's just a great reminder as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, I know Jamie shared that I do a lot of work around um, children and families with autism. And I think um, those groups have just been remarkable during the pandemic. Unfortunately, you know, the news is not always good about the fact that hybrid learning and virtual learning was not good for them, not a, not a good fit, but they certainly did come up with guidance and information and strategies, I think, that will benefit everybody. And so if we look to some of these organizations, I do a lot of volunteer work with Autism Speaks, but there's a lot of organizations out there, and this is a hyperlinked one, you'll see strategies that will help support literally not only children with autism, but anybody um, through um, uncertain and difficult times. And you can learn a lot by sort of going to those special populations for um, information. I am also a really big fan here in New York, but I know they're branching out um, everywhere, but the Child Mind Institute is doing some really great uh, stuff, um, provided all kinds of wonderful, um, you know, research and evidence-based supports um, during the pandemic. But they, just about two weeks ago, I, I got an email about their campaign called Getting Better Together, and, you know, as you saw that earlier slide, I was like, oh, my God, this is great. That's how we're going to do this. We're going to get better together. Um, but I've been reminding children and families in particular that asking for help is one of those important first steps. 
Um, it's amazing to me when I'm with a brand new family that, that maybe has not asked for help before, or maybe doesn't know who a school psychologist is or another mental health professional. Um, they will often say things like, I had no idea you existed or this help was available, but I am so grateful that you do. Um, it's the idea that we're going to have to get information out there, destigmatize mental health, and the Child Mind Institute does some really outstanding work in that area. Um, we are going to be struggling with the new normal while trying to keep all of our worries under control. And I think it's just important to remind people that we do not have to do it alone. Um, you know, which sort of lends itself to sometimes what can be a bit more of a difficult conversation, and that's the one around suicide, but, but maybe the way to phrase that or reframe it is suicide prevention. Um, it, it's a topic that, you know, sometimes still is in the shadows, um, and people will often perpetuate the myth that if somehow we talk about suicide, we're going to give kids ideas. Um, we know now and we've known for a while that that is just not true, that if we talk about suicide, in fact, what we do is we prevent suicide. And so when kids are struggling with tremendous anxiety, sometimes in silence, and that develops into depression, and they have difficulty thinking about their choices and, and how to solve their problems, unfortunately, sometimes in adults and impulsive teen brains and even in children, they begin to think of, of self-harm, of, of taking their own life. The good news is if you've got just a little bit of time and you are an administrator or a school professional or anybody who just cares about kids, there is some really remarkable information that exists. Um, the National Association of School Psychologists worked together with the Trevor Project and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention on the um, hyperlink that's connected to the model school district policy on suicide prevention. So if you click that link, you are gonna be given board of education district policy statements. You're gonna be given um, screeners and access to all kinds of information. It really is a toolkit that you simply need to kind of start at page one, work your way through and you'll have you know, a terrific um, knowledge base as far as suicide prevention and what you need need specifically in the schools. Um, you know, here in New York, I've worked with some terrific people, um, in, including, you know, the um, Office of Mental Health in New York State to develop a guide specifically for New York schools. And so in there, um, you will also find reference to all kinds of wonder, wonderful materials, including training videos and, and materials that you can pretty much just take that prevention guide, bring it to a small committee in your school, and then you've got um, at least the framework or the start of something really special, because at the end of the day, I, uh, we are saving lives by doing this. And I, I am worried you know, that the pandemic will, will make that an increasing challenge for school professionals, certainly for mental health professionals. So don't feel like you've got to do it alone. There's great resources out there. Um, I, I used, I still try to do yoga. Um, I, I, I don't get excited to go to do yoga, but then once I'm there or afterwards, I feel like it's the greatest thing ever, but somehow tied to yoga, I often think of the work around mindfulness and meditation. And the truth is during the pandemic, I spent a lot more hours in meditation and mindfulness um, and even just you know some self-care. So I, I use the phrase pause to be present um, which is really not my own terminology, but one of the organizations that I was fortunate enough here in New York to partner up with. Um, and they, they led some wonderful meditation um, courses for teachers. You know, the idea that if we as adults don't take care of ourselves, if we don't find our own opportunities to be our best, we are not going to be help the, help the children um, that, that we you know, serve. And so this link will take you to some additional information around the importance of trying to build in some moments in the school day or just provide opportunities for adults around um, meditation. Um, and when I took one of the courses um, over the last couple of months, what I realized is from the moment we wake till the moment we go to bed, we really are going, going, going constantly, you know, with, with thoughts, images, information. 
And we are rarely given an opportunity to just sit in silence or just to turn that brain off or just to reflect on the day or on the thoughts in our head. And I think I made this one of the ending slides simply because it comes full circle to what we started talking about, which is the idea that we get a lot of anxious thoughts in our heads. And if we can control and manage those better, if we can learn the skills and practice the skills, we are all going to be much healthier for it. And this um, pause to be present is, is a wonderful reminder of that, certainly with a little bit of humor in there. He's got a little red nose. Um, I have sort of just a, a closing you know, reminder, and, and I know we're going to jump into questions in just a minute. Um, it's really that idea that um, I do not have all the answers. I, I, I Hopefully, I've provided you with tremendous resources to get this work done. Use the PowerPoint, go back, click the hyperlinks. You'll say, oh, this is great. It was something I was searching for. Maybe, maybe it's even better than just Googling it randomly, right? It's sort of a, a trustworthy source. But I do not have all the answers. I think some of the answers absolutely have to come from you or um, from us together. And my, my simple reminder is that no one has this all figured out. I know I mentioned that in the very first slide as well, that that's one of the unique challenges of the pandemic is that it, it's difficult to find you know, clear answers. I think there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of places to look, but we've got to put all of this together. So please give yourselves permission to not be perfect, to make mistakes, to learn, and to simply just try to be your very best. Um, and I, I like Brene Brown's um, you know, work and, and, and um, messages. And she says here, you know, empathy has no script. It's simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connecting and communicating that incredibly healing message of you are not alone. And um, I think with that, I will turn it back over to Jamie to help me field a few of the questions that, that maybe have come up in the remaining time that we've got. But thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Dr. Faustino, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I, I, I too, um, love doing yoga. Ha struggle to get myself there, but always feel so much better after. And I think, you know, during during these times, like you said, giving ourselves the grace and the time and the space um, to take care of ourselves, so that we can take care of those around us and our students, um, um, it's very important. And um, I have received a number of requests for um, the deck. So for those of you who, who have not seen the, the chat, I did mention that we will be sending it out, but, but due to the, um, obviously you all want to start looking at these resources. So I did put a PDF version of this deck into the chat that you are welcome to download and start um, accessing all of the wonderful resources right now. Um, so please take a look at that. We will send it out via email as well. Um, and I have it, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, again, I, I keep, um, I'm getting, I don't see the PDF. Uh, I, we, will, we will make sure to send this out directly after. I, I am trying, I put it in the Zoom chat and I, I, I apologize. Um, you know, Jamie, I saw your PDF, but I wonder if it only went to the panelists, if maybe... Let me... Pardon, I am... Uh, I, I, I am going to do that one more time. I think you're right. So um, apologies. I think it did just go to the panelists. I noticed that now. So if you'll no, give me no just a second, I will drop that <laughs> in. And then please, um, I'm sure there are some... Let's see. And I sort of got the idea, you know, when um, when the pandemic hit and um, teachers were, were doing these like, I don't know exactly what they were called, but it was like a Google classroom with images and you could just like create a website and then go and click on an image and it would take you to another resource. I sort of thought, what a cool way to do a presentation, right? I'm going to create a slideshow that, you know, maybe doesn't have too much words, maybe just more images, but is like a deeper level for you to go and access. So that, that was the idea behind this. Please use it um, in that manner. But And even just thinking about how we could use that with, with students, right? I mean, the exact same thing as a providing background knowledge and, and giving them the resources. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing that most of you can see them now. Um, if you, if you don't have, um, if you're not able to access it, I'm going to put my email address in the chat, um, 
please send me an email and I will send it. Um, I will reply back to you with that PDF um, so that you don't have to wait until we uh, have those certificates ready to go. Um, I think there is overwhelming, in, in, you know, overwhelming. Um, thank you for the resources. Thank you for um, the great presentation. Um, and those of you who are, please don't put your emails in the chat. I can't download the chat. So please email me and I will send it back to you. Um, I'm not going to be able to, to get everybody's email addresses over um, to send you an email. So please just email me. It's in there. It's jdowney at elumatherapy.com. Um, and I, Dr. Cross, you know, I can, I, I know I speak for um, the, the many people on the phone when I say thank you, thank you, thank you for this wonderful um, presentation. I'm gonna, going once, going twice, going three times, if there are not any questions, I think probably all of the great resources that you've provided have answered all of their questions. So um, I will, we will sign off and, uh, Thank you all for attending today. I do, um, Dr. Felsino, if you could go to one more slide, I want to mention we're having a webinar, um, our next webinar, and I believe uh, he is uh, one of Dr. Felsino's very good friends. Um, will yeah, he... I, do, I know Ben Fernandez, you are in for a treat. He is amazing, sign up. Please come and join us. Um, we'll be looking at planning for the transition back to brick and mortar. Um, addressing student needs in that context. So please join us on July 9th. Um, and we hope you have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend. And thank you for the work that you do for students every single day. And thank you, Dr. Faustino, so, so much. My pleasure, my pleasure.